Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Eden Road podcast where on tonight's show we're going to be previewing a big game down at the GTEC on Saturday night and I'm delighted to be joined by AFC James on Twitter who's the Gunners expert that's going to be running us through this preview. James mate thanks so much for taking the time and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this actually. No, mate. Thank, thanks for having me. And um, I'm honoured to be called the, the Gunners expert. That's the first time people have since anyone said that about me. So yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> good stuff, mate. Good stuff. Remember, guys, just before we get going, if you haven't listened to the podcast before, please do share it around with your mates. Subscribe to our YouTube and Spotify channels and also give us a follow on our socials. That's at the Elam Road on Twitter and at Elam Road Pod on Instagram. Right, James, first question I ask all, all my opposition guests just before we sort of get into the nitty gritty stuff. How would you assess Arsenal's season so far? It's 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 weird because we've had a bit of a mixed bag season. Um, obviously, I don't think any Arsenal fan would describe themselves as being happy with the way the season has gone. It's been very itty bitty. We lost against um, we obviously lost against Newcastle in that game that caused so much con- controversy. Uh, we drew against Fulham against a ten man Fulham. It was an incredibly sloppy game. We drew, drew against Chelsea, which we really shouldn't have done. But ultimately, we're one point off Man City and we haven't really got our first gear. Which um, So it's it's not been a great start to season, but all things considered and um, where we are compared to the opposition, I'd still say I'd snap your hand off if I was one point behind top spot at this point. Context aside, um, you've got to take that really. Just it's, it's not in the running order, but just, just on the Newcastle game, um, obviously it caused... A lot of talk and and we seem to speak about VAR on like every episode of the podcast we do and but with with the sort of fashion that the Newcastle game ended in Mikel Arteta coming out just just what were your thoughts as an Arsenal fan because I think from a fan from the outside I thought the club statement was a little bit weird didn't really understand that I I was I I was completely with Arteta I, I kind of feel like if we're allowed to have opinions and journalists allowed to have opinions why the hell can't a manager have an opinion, especially when he's the most important person in, in that kind of situation. But what, what was your kind of feelings after that game? Uh, it was, I, I was, I'd just come back from Budapest that day. It was just, I was just <laughs> exasperated. Like the, um, the thing I was more annoyed about, honestly, wasn't the goal itself. It was the Bruno Gimaraes, um elbow, because with the goal, there were two things that they actually couldn't check, the offside and the ball going out of play, and it really could have gone either way. And with the push, I think it was a push. But again, it's not as clear cut. But the Bruno Gimaraes, where he elbowed him in the back of the head, I don't see how that can be interpreted in any other way. And they did release this, the footage for it. And I still don't agree with it. He said his elbow wasn't used as a weapon. It's one of those things in football where as soon as something like that happens, straight away you go, I shouldn't have done that. It, and it doesn't really matter how much contact that is. As soon as you elbow someone, you've elbowed them. It, it's it's not an accident. It's not like there's levels to how much you can climb on someone's back. You either elbow them or you don't. So <laughs> the fact that he wasn't sent off for that was the thing that annoyed me most. In terms of Arteta's statement as well, I, as a, I agree with you, Arteta had every right to make the statement. The only reason why the club backed him up on it was their way of saying, we stand with the manager. So I, I agree it was it was unusual the way the club came out and made the statement because it wasn't like Liverpool where there was a factual error. It was just another VAR error. But um, yeah, the reason why a bigger thing was made out of it from the club, I think, was just to try and show support for Arteta because we're trying to have this all in this together mentality. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to talk too much about VAR because honestly, I just said it before, but like <laughs> we talk about it way too much nowadays. I, I want to get onto Arsenal sort of hopes this season do, do you see yourselves as title contenders you, you mentioned at the top you're only a point of city you'd have bitten someone's hand off if they'd given that to you at the start of the season how how confident are you going to be in there in that race with city come the end I, I would never be confident as an arsenal fan in title race because um we've not won the title since what 2004 so i was i was four or five years old when that happened it's been so many years i'll never be confident even at the back end of last season there was no part I would never have turned around and said I'm confident. I'd have said it looks like we're definitely in the driving driving seat, but I'd have never said I'm confident that we get it over the line. Um, so in terms of this season again, I won't ever be confident. I'd like to be there or thereabouts by the end. And then hopefully we can start to build momentum a little bit like City did last season. But yeah, in terms of confident, you won't get me there. <laughs> <laughs> in in terms of what's changed from last season, you just mentioned it there. I from a from a fan outside the top six looking into one of the top six clubs 
I would say the biggest difference is is Declan Rice in that midfield. Is that something you'd agree with? Is he like kind of the main thing? Do, well, first of all, do you do you think you're a better team than last season? I would, I would ask first. Right now, no. But over a season, I think we will be because we've lost the ability to blow teams away because we've lost a lot of attacking fluidity. But the way we played last season wasn't as sustainable. A lot of games we had to really get over the line in the last five minutes. And that's because if we didn't blow teams away straight away, then we got a little bit unstuck because then they'd sit back and then we wouldn't know how to pick the lock. This season, we've become a little bit more calculated in our approach. It's it's come at the detriment to our fans because our fans would love to see us try and blow teams away in the first 30 minutes. So the expectations have become higher and our fans are a little bit disgruntled about that, which is weird because, as I say, we're still doing very well. Um, so in terms of, yeah, we're less fluid, we're less exciting, but we're more controlled. And to win titles, you have to be a little bit more controlled and calculated. And as I say, over a 50 game season, multiple competitions, you can't try and play gung ho. It might work for 30, 35 games, but then ultimately in the end, it's so easy to burn out. And we could have just about got over the line last season, including scraping games against Southampton, Bournemouth, etc. But ultimately, it's a, it's a lot to ask for. And that's why City's just well oiled machine keeps getting them over the line every season. And is ha, ha, what have you made of Declan Rice since since he's come in? Unbelievable. Like I, I was so excited and, and there were rumblings for a long time. And I thought, surely not. Like this, this guy's ridiculous. Um, but really strong rumblings that he was going to come to Arsenal. And he is just that sort of player. I love those signings that you can just see them being in your team for five to ten years. And um he's just that guy. And I think he's one of England's best players. He's one of Arsenal's best players. And I, I do think he's a world class footballer. So to sign an English player, I know people talked about the fee, but when players like Anthony are going for 100 million, I think Declan Rice is a quite a reasonable price at 100 mil, to be honest. Yeah, no, I think he's, I think he's absolute quality. I think he's absolute quality, and uh, I think he, he, if if you do go on to win the title this season, I reckon he'll he'll be one of the like important cogs in that team. But I, in terms of other players, I'm I'm quite tuned into Arsenal Twitter. I have no idea why, but I, I see Arsenal <laughs> everywhere on my timeline. Um, I want to speak about Kai Havertz, and I also want to speak about Martin Odegaard as well, because for me, Odegaard was one of the players of the season last year, but. Looking through Arsenal conversations on Twitter, I'm, I'm hearing that maybe some fans are a little bit disillusioned with his performances this season. Kai Havertz is a bit of a mixed bag. So could you just talk me through those two specifically? Uh, starting off with Erdegaard, because I think it's a little bit simpler. He has just, I think a lot of players, not every player is going to be a Mo Salah and get a goal and assist every game. He has had a worse season. He's also, I think, been punished slightly by the fact that the system in midfield has been tweaking a lot. He, when you have, he had Xhaka on the other side last season, so he knew exactly where his role was. He was the more advanced out of the midfield. Now he's had Havertz, Vieira, Smith, where he's had all sorts of players on the left-hand side of that midfield, which means he has to adapt his role because sometimes he's playing deeper, sometimes he's playing really in the final line. So he's i've always said he's arteta's brains on the pitch and last season he thrived because of that because he was basically given the free role but this season arteta's kind of getting him to do a little bit more of the dirty work a little bit more of the pressing some of the deeper build up that you wouldn't really get as much credit for some games he's looked incredible so against psv in the champions league he was really good other games such as the tottenham game he he was genuinely just really poor and there's two aspects to that. One, he can just have a downturn in form. And two, there's also been a little bit talk of him having a bit of a hip problem, struggling with that recently. So I don't know what to put that down to. But yeah, he, he has definitely dropped the level. But even Erdegaard at a much worse level, unfortunately, is still a lot better than Havertz, who I've tried to enjoy as much as I can this season. There are glimpses of him and I think, yeah, that makes sense. That could work. But just not enough for me to justify anywhere near that price tag, especially when you had Zobozlai, Madison, Lucas Paqueta, all of these players in and around the market at a similar value. Um, I don't know. I trust Arteta because he bought himself that trust, but I just need to see more. And I don't want to. I keep lowering the expectations for Havertz and saying I can't judge him on the price tag, etc. But you still got to judge him as an Arsenal level player. And I don't think he's been delivering to that so far. 
For, for me, though, I, I was kind of, I was writing this question and I was thinking, you know, you've got a player like Emil Smith-Rowe who last, uh, well, a couple of seasons ago and last season w- was really, really good. And you bring in Havertz to play in a kind of similar position. I don't know if I'm wrong there, but if, if Smith-Rowe was to play in the Arsenal team, I would I would assume that Havertz would be the one to drop out. But I'm thinking when I've seen Smith-Rowe play, especially against Brentford, when he played against us in the League Cup, and uh, on the first game of the season, and even in the the return fixture in the, in our first season, he was the best player on the pitch by by a long way. And there were there were rumours sort of around the start of the season. I say rumours, but just people on Twitter saying he'd be a good fit for Brentford. And I, I would have snapped your hand off if <laughs> if if Brentford were in for Smith Rowe because every sign I've seen him play, he's been incredible. What's what's happening with him? Uh, it's complicated. He he has incredible amounts of fitness problems. Um, He's out injured at the moment. So he came back for that Brentford game and out got injured again. A lot of the talk was that over the past season or so, his just fitness in general is poor. So even when he is fit, whether he's able to play a full game for 90 minutes, whether he's able to press in the same way that Erdegaard and Havertz can, is up for question. Um, so the glimpses you get are really good, but it's just very hard to rely on Smith Rowe as a player because you don't get that consistently. And interestingly, when we did play you in the cup, there was talk around then that Smith Rowe was looking the fittest he'd ever been and stuff, but then he goes and gets injured again. So it's one of those things where you can't really rely on him as a player. Also, I do think that Smith Rowe and Havertz are almost completely on the other ends of the spectrum where Smith Rowe will do everything that looks good. So on the ball is where Smith Rowe excels. He when the he's got the ball at his feet when he's driving at defenders that's where he looks really good on the half turn. Havertz's game is more about running into space off the ball, um, pressing, winning duels and stuff like that. And I know that sounds like such. It, it sounds very much like I'm just defending Havertz because I've got nothing that I can actually say for him. But his strengths, I would say, are stuff that you don't notice as much. And um, I think that's why you look at both of them and say, "Wow, Smith Rowe is." so much better than Havertz. I genuinely believe in the same team, they probably have a similar impact, but it's things like winning duels that Arteta loves. I don't know if you've watched um, All or Nothing, but there's a a quote where he goes, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Um, (laughs) And I think that's one of the reasons why he wanted Havertz for these things that most people are less likely to notice. But again, I still need more than that, more than just winning duels, running into space. I still need actual output from a midfielder because Xhaka got seven goals, seven assists last season whilst doing all the rest too. Yeah, I think uh, it's that you're definitely right. I, I noticed like when people are getting on Havertz's is back, especially on Arsenal Twitter, they some someone will bring out the duel stats and he does win most of his duels when he plays. Uh, so, it's, so it's a good point. But you mentioned Smith Rowe's injuries. One area of Arsenal's side that kind of, let you down in terms of the title race last season was was the injuries to to Saliba. Um this season, I, I mean Gabriel, when 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 we played you in the cup, honestly, I think it was the best defender I've ever seen at the G Tech. Genuinely, I really wasn't expecting it because Roll uh I was just about to say Rolls Royce. Saliba Saliba is a Rolls Royce. Saliba is a complete Rolls Royce for centre half and I've seen him play a couple of times now. But Gabriel, I was I was so surprised just with his pace the way he just really just shut down Brian and Bumo and Johan Wisso in, in ways that defenders this season have not been able to. How vital is that partnership to Arsenal? It's it's funny you say that, actually, because both of these players have been so... Obviously, it's the international break at the moment, and both these players, just for whatever reason, are just disliked on the international level. Uh, Gabriel <laughs> played both games for Brazil, and a lot of Brazilian fans are just moaning and cursing about him. Brazil in general just have a terrible system. And I think if you took any defender into that Brazil system, they're not going to look great. Saliba, for whatever reason, again, doesn't seem to play as well for France. People will try and pin any any loss on either of those players because it's Arsenal and people love to hate on Arsenal. Um, <laughs> But put them in Arteta's system and that's where they play the majority of their games. They are an unbelievable pairing. And I just love how they both complement each other, but individually they also don't have many weaknesses. So you could compare it to a little bit like Koscielny and Mertzaka, where Saliba's the Mertzaka. He'd sweep up a little bit around the back and was a bit more composed. And Gabriel's more Koscielny, where he'd be more aggressive in challenges. But what I love about these two is 
Saliba doesn't have the Mertesacker lack of pace and um, Gabriel doesn't have the Koscielny lack of, I don't know, strength in duels, for example. So whilst they do complement each other stylistically, neither of them really have any weaknesses. And you're right, absolutely right about Umbermo being shut down by Gabriel because he's so good at defending in the channels, which is really useful to our system because... Um, Often Zinchenko or whoever's at left back will go up the pitch. Gabriel will find himself fairly isolated, but he does. He's just able to deal with defenders quite well. So um, it's a perfect defensive pairing. And there is a photo that I love, which is Gabriel holding Saliba like up by his arms. I think that's a perfect representation of those two where <laughs> Saliba is so much more easy on the eye and will always get the credit. But without Gabriel, I don't think he'd be the same player that he is. Maybe hence why he struggles more for France. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I think Gabriel doesn't get the plug he deserves. It's been, it kind of changed my mind when I saw him play at Brentford. I was, I was just thinking, wow, this, this guy's unreal. And I, it, I love to of... hear that, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll move on to the kind of Brentford contingent of, of the podcast. I, I do want to talk about Ivan Tony because so much. I feel like every time Ivan Tony is mentioned, it's in the same breath as Arsenal. Um, what do you think of him? Is he the last piece in Arsenal's puzzle? Just how, how highly do you rate him? Because us as Brentford fans... Um, 20 goals in the Premier League last season playing for Brentford. I'm thinking if he moves to a club like Arsenal or City or, or any of those clubs in the kind of the upper echelons of the division, I'm, I'm thinking he bags as many as Haaland. And I'm, I, I really don't say that, like trying to trying to be trying to compare him to Haaland because obviously Haaland is a better number nine. But in terms of a complete striker, I, I would say Ivan has got more to his game than someone of that ilk. What, what do you think of him? Um. It's, I, I'm terrible at judging strikers, ultimately. I <laughs> I love Gabriel Jesus, but his weakness is, as he <laughs> spoke out on social media today, which is he do, he's, the strength of his game isn't scoring goals. So we do need a striker of Ivan Tony's profile. Um, I don't agree with the fee that you've... Uh, naturally, <laughs> obviously, of course, you're going to put a 100 million price tag. Do I think he's worth 100 million? No. Do I think Evan Ferguson's worth 150 million? Also, no. Um, I very much like him. I don't. I don't like him as much as you claim, which I don't <laughs> completely understand, by the way, because you're a Brentford fan and he's been so good for you. Um, but I do think there's a slight caveat. I know penalties are part of the sport, but last season he got twenty goals, but I think six of them were penalties, right? So um, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, but and Umbermo got I think eleven goals or something without penalties or maybe with one penalty. So if you take away both of their penalties and you say Umbermo's got eleven goals and Tony's got fourteen, that's quite. I just think it's an interesting comparison to say. Hang on a minute. So Tony's scoring twenty goals in this Brentford side. Well, Umbermo's also got eleven goals in this Brentford side. So would he score as many as Haaland or anywhere near as Haaland? Maybe not. I think Tony does benefit from being the main guy. Um, it's it's a complicated one, as I say, and I don't have a good answer to this. I really like him as a player. I see people posting his underlying stats, which aren't quite as good as his stats. But then again, he's always been a good finisher. So why does it matter? Um, so as I say, I don't have a good answer to this question. I like him. I think he would be a very good signing for Arsenal. Is he where I want to put my 100 million? That I'm not sure because it depends on where Ossiman lies. It depends on is Vlahovic available for cheap. I don't love Vlahovic either. There's no there's no striker who I see on the market who I think is a perfect fit in terms of price, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Tony probably is the best out there at the moment. Let's let's assume Ossiman is unobtainable. Do you do you agree that Arsenal will need to strengthen in January in terms of a number nine? Or would you rather them spend their money elsewhere? Um, I do agree we should. I don't think we will, though. From from what I gather, I think we will sign a defender um, because I don't think Timber will be back this season and Arteta loves his defenders and he's probably still has PTSD from last season having to lean on holding at the end of the season. Um, but yeah, I do just think when it comes to crunch time, you need a player like Ivan Tony, especially in the final 30 minutes of the game where a team goes back to the wall you need someone who can you can cross the ball into and win a header and have a is the physical profile for that can he win headers in the last 10 minutes can he beat a man the same way Giroud or Tony can I wouldn't say so so um yes absolutely do we need Ivan Tony for the running I think it also depends where we are in January if we're looking like 
it's a big possibility if someone else goes over the line, um, then I think Arteta might go to Kroenke. If we can sign Tony, then we might be able to do the rest. But also, from what I gather, it's very, very unlikely you'd sell him in January, no? I mean, it's. I think it, uh, unless a hundred million pound bid comes in, I don't think we will. But I think sort of with the start we had to the season, we've kind of spoken on our pod before. It very much would depend on how we were in January. If we felt like we could sell him, I think we should just to cash in on him and get the most money we could. But I'm hearing rumours that he could sign a new contract extension, which I think I is that. bollocks. I think is bollocks. But um, yeah, no, it's it's a difficult one. I think if we were in trouble in January, I don't think we would, uh, regardless of the fee. But <clears throat> with with uh it, it looks like we're going to be all right like i say that now but uh in the in the last few games we've kind of started to pick up the points so i wouldn't be surprised if he plays with brentford again and then we kind of sell him for 70 and how 18. long how long does he have left on his contract year and a half 18 months come january okay, really? so yeah yeah so if we were to sell him in january to have 18 months left and you know it, it would be i i genuinely think 100 million was the minimum in terms of today's market i know you don't like the fee and i don't like the fee either. i don't think he's a 100 million pound player but yeah. in terms of today's market if you're looking at the most expensive players in football they're going to be the ones that are scoring 20 goals um whereas you know like chelsea buying caicedo and enzo for oh, exactly, 200 million exactly. i know yeah they've inflated the market so that's top but anyway and, and strikers <laughs> strikers are at such a premium a player of ivan tony's caliber you you've got i'm sure chelsea would want him as well even though they've signed a billions worth of players united would be absolutely falling over him arsenal want him so you've got no shortage of suitors so why would you lower the price so much unless tony started trying to push his way out the door but i don't believe that's going to be the case yeah yeah i mean it remains to be seen but speaking of brentford players i, I want to talk about david Raya because i've got a lot of arsenal fans uh, who are mates who are somewhat perplexed by his start at Arsenal. I, again, like Tony, I'll back him to the hill. He, when he was at Brentford, he was one of the best keepers in the league. Um, but he, I mean, he hasn't had a bad start, but it's it's not been a convincing start. And I know the sort of connection Arsenal fans had with Ramsdale, which I totally get, by the way. I think his sort of winding up of opposition fans is is top notch. Like, I lo absolutely love the guy for that. When, when we played him, when we played you at the G-Tech earlier in the season in the Cup, every time he'd make a save, he was turning around and giving it to the home fans. Which and I he'll be, love. sorry to interrupt, but he'll be playing you again this weekend because yeah, Raya's exactly. got tied, I assume, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, but what, what have you made of David Raya? Um, I hate to have this, because sometimes I worry that I back Arteta too much and that I only like him because Arteta's bought him for a reason. But I genuinely think Raya... It's more of a stylistic thing. So far from what he's shown us, I don't think he's been exceeding. I don't think the difference between him and Ramsdale has been massive. I believe he is a better goalkeeper than Ramsdale. Do I believe he's played better than Ramsdale would have? Not massively, but what he does do is, I don't know if you've seen the interview, but Ramsdale came out and said that he didn't feel so comfortable standing where Arteta wanted him to stand. So he'd have to find a middle ground. And now clearly Arteta's gone, well, fine but i need a keeper who can do that because to play our system we need a keeper who can play as a third center back in build up and that is what raya can do and there was one moment i can't remember what team it was but he picked the ball up in his hands and he did one of those i think it's called a sidewinder where he booted it to martinelli and the pinpoint accuracy ramsdale can do that but what raya does so well which is the, I guess the sign of a keeper that's really really natural with the ball at his feet is he he, he kicked it flat so the ball comes to Martinelli and it's not bouncing and it's not it's not going to come, it's not going to take ages to get to ground. So he's pinged it across to Martinelli and we're on the attack. And that's, those tiny details are what I think Arteta's gone right. We finished five points behind Man City last season. What can we upgrade? We've got a centre-back pairing who I wouldn't swap for any other pairing in the world. We've got X, Y and Z. Sure, we can get a new striker, but that's not easy to do. OK, we can get David Raya for three million on loan and then another 27 million. That's an absolute bargain. We can effectively upgrade our keeper to go from Ramsdale to Raya and also make money because it's likely Ramsdale will fetch more than 30 million. So Arteta has gone, OK. Um, there have been some shaky moments. And I, as I said earlier with Senemax, I don't love players with weaknesses. And his obvious weaknesses is that he is a little bit small. Um, but... <laughs> I think I don't think it helps the whole media circus around it. I wonder whether he feels extra pressure because of that. Um, 
as I say, I don't know, but I have liked what I've seen, barring a few mistakes, which some of them I think have been overblown. For example, the Mudrick cross, I really don't think any keeper saves that. I think if you've got Alisson in goal and the same thing happens, no one blames Alisson. The only reason why he's being blamed is because he is small. What, what's been the fans' reaction to Ramsdale's exclusion? Is it is it kind of 50-50 or are people more back in Ramsdale? What's, what's been that? Uh, it, depend, it depends what circle because um, some Arsenal fans got quite disgruntled at Ramsdale at the end of the last season because of the mistakes he was making. For example, him passing the ball straight to, I can't remember who the, I don't know if it was Alcaraz, Southampton striker, whoever it was. He passed it straight to them. We go one nil down, and he had a tendency at home to just. He said it himself in interviews to have terrible com, um, concentration away from home. Fine, he gets to chat to the fans. He seemed to be fine, but at home for whatever reason, it just didn't work. Um, now all goalkeepers have a mistake in them. I think Raya will pass the ball straight to an opposition this season, but I believe it will happen less often. And he did it against Burnley. We were nil nil, and Burnley were on the attack. And he made a really, really important save. And I just think, would Ramsdale make that same save because he wouldn't be as concentrated because we're nil-nil at home? And that's the difference. If you go one-nil down to Burnley, that it's it's so hard to measure, but that, that could cost you the whole game. But Ryze made a good save because he's in the right position, he switched on. And that that's the difference maker. So um the fans have been mixed. You've got more old head Arsenal fans who loved Ramsdale because he's English because he engages with the fans. You've got tacticos who are a little bit more on the side of, yeah, he, he gives us this, he gives us that. And I think you've got a lot of people in between who are saying, is he is he worth the whole media circus? Now we're going to have no second keeper again if Ramsdale has to leave. Um, I lean towards Raya, but I'm not 100%. Yeah, it was worthwhile. Um. I'm still mixed. I'll judge at the end of the season. Yeah, it's it's definitely going to be interesting to see how it turns out. I mean, to be honest, when when the whole transfer was made, I think the media circus was inevitable because it was just yeah. like it, it it was it was always going to happen. It's um, interesting got... though because because with Leno, obviously a very similar thing happened, but because Leno's not English and um, his agent Ramsdale's agent is his brother, I think. Um, or whoever his agent was, they got involved with the media and wanted to stir it up a little bit to try and get Ramsdale back into the team. Um, but none of that happened with Leno, obviously. Um, but it's just interesting how different the um, situations are. I don't think the fact that we gave Ramsdale a contract last season helped at all. I can't explain that. And apparently we're also not open to selling Ramsdale now, which, again, doesn't make much sense. No, I, I would have thought with Rhea coming in, I mean, to be fair, I've spoken. I've spoken to mates, and and they've said, you know, we need two solid number ones. But I mean, with with how good Ramsdale is, you can't see him. I can't see him staying at Arsenal and not having first team football. No, no, you, you need the the idea of having two good goalkeepers is perfect. But in practice, the second goalkeeper needs to be happy. And with Ramsdale, it doesn't seem like he is at the moment. His dad came out in an interview and said he would lost his smile. So, if that is an yeah. indication to say he doesn't want to be a backup, then I don't know what it is. Yeah. Uh, all right, mate, we've got, got a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up because I know we're going a little bit over time. Just just a question on Brentford, just just Brentford. What, what have you made of us so far in the Premier League? Is something I ask to all, to all my guests. I've I've always had a soft spot for Brentford and Thomas Frank. I don't know why. I think I think you've had a, a decent start to Premier League this season. I couldn't tell you exactly where you are in the league, mid-table-ish. Ninth. Uh, when we might have dropped, actually, since since the Arsenal loss, uh, Liverpool lost. We, we, I think we're a little bit behind that, actually. But yeah, mid mid table, um, we're eleventh. And you've always you've always got a big win in you. So I don't know. I, I like watching Brentford. I like your style of play. And Burmo especially, I think, is a very underrated player. Um, but yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't have too much to say about Brentford. If you're on TV, I'll watch you. As I say, I'm I'm not. I don't tend to put a stream on. And I think your I like your system. Some of your players like um, Jensen this season impressed me for a while. Um, He's really good. And Thomas Frank, you're very much punching above your weight, I feel. And yeah. um, long may that continue, because <laughs> I'm not just saying this, I'm on a Brentford pod, but um, I like the way you operate as a club. And 
there's there's a lot of sinister clubs with all these dodgy operations going around. Brentford seem <laughs> fairly innocent with everything else going on. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I mean, our, our, <laughs> our owner our owner made his money out of gambling, but like, we can oh, really? kind of go back and forth on that for for a while, especially with all the Tony stuff. But speak, speaking of Tony, I want to just finish by sort of talking about the Brentford Arsenal backdrop. I know you've just said we're fairly inoffensive and we're punching above our weight, but I mean, there is a little bit. We first game of the season, we beat you two 0 then there's the whole nice kick about with the boys thing that kind of continues into some other stuff. Um, do you think this fixture has a little bit of a psychological component at all? Because, you know, and I'm speaking about the sort of Amazon doc as well. It was mentioned in that. And I know you've got a psychology background. I used to do a bit of producing slash editing for No Ratings Pod. And I, I've tuned into that. You've got a psychology background. Do you think there's a bit of a psychological edge to this game? Uh <sighs> I can't. What was the score last? What was our last time we played? If you if you can remind me. One one. Because I remember one, one, the Tony the Tony VAR thing. The Norgard offside. Oh, one, 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 your players. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that was the last time we played. Because the time before was the, the, the was the three nil Fabio Vieira to yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the one that's freshest in my mind, which has given me such like a false perception of playing at Griffin Park because I see. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's, it's called the G Tech. G Tech. Right yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> It's a new stadium, isn't it? It's not even... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah news, sorry, news, it's yeah, not... Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Fabio Vieira, that goal, and it was that was such a weirdly comfortable game because it was a midday kickoff and the atmosphere was weirdly flat. Um, so when I think of us playing away to you, that's the game that comes to mind. I think, well, why are we so stressed? But yeah, it, GTEC's not an easy place to go to. We drew last season in ridiculous circumstances so hopefully <laughs> hopefully that will be the fire and this time our tet on the dressing room won't be nice kick about with the boys it'll be where's the fog in lines so <laughs> um, yeah yeah I, you're, you're not an easy team to beat will there be spice i don't know we had such a good um i think that was actually the only london derby that we dropped any points in last season i think we got 28 out of 30 points in london derbies last season um so a little bit of spice yeah i wouldn't mind the little nice kick about with the boys but unfortunately tony <laughs> won't be there but he was definitely one of the people that caused the problem for our center backs last season because i do recall the game and the dual stats yeah. after it i think tony won like 14 out of 15 he, duels against that, Saliba that, and gabriel that was up there with one of his best games of the season je, je, when, yeah. when we played you when we played you with the emirates he was he was on another level uh your center backs couldn't compete with him but you know, I, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I, I really hope it's going to be a good game. Obviously, no Tony there, um, but I I think it will be good. I think Saturday night under the lights, it will be a similar atmosphere to what it was um, when we played you the first time <laughs> when we were in this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping for a good game. But James, I, I really appreciate you taking the time, mate, and uh, good luck for Saturday. The Edinburgh podcast right. will be back next week to go over the Arsenal game and also look ahead to Luton the following weekend. Remember, guys, just before we leave, if you haven't listened to the podcast before, please do go and subscribe to our YouTube and Spotify channels. Leave a rating as well and also give us a follow on our socials. That's at the Eden Road on Twitter and at Eden Road Pod on Instagram. James, mate, it's been a pleasure and yeah, good luck for Saturday.